Welcome to worship. Welcome to the Kirk and welcome home. It's good to be with you and good for us to be together on this Sunday morning. I want to offer a special welcome to anyone that might be visiting with us, worshiping with us for one of the first times. I do invite you to check out our church website, kirkinthehills.org, to learn more about our church, why we love it here, and maybe even look into the Kirk Fam, our From Home affiliate membership, as a way to connect to our church more formally. Today is Father's Day, so I want to wish a very happy Father's Day to all the fathers worshiping with us today. We do hope you are celebrated well, that you get to watch a baseball game maybe, and, uh, and, and have some barbecue because that's what Father's Day is really should be about, and I hope you feel loved uh, on this Father's Day Sunday. We do have a car show here at the church today if you'd like to stop in later as a way to celebrate Father's Day with your church family we do invite anyone to come that would like to come and, uh, and then show their car or take a look at some of the cars in our lot. At 12.15, we do have a class on prayer. Pastor Angela will be leading that. You can find the link online, and that will be found on our website and on Facebook. These are the announcements. Let's listen to the sound of the bell and be drawn together in worship. <laughs> With joyful hearts, let us call one another to worship. In this world, kingdom living. In our mouths, kingdom praises. In our hearts, kingdom goals. In our hands, kingdom gifts. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
come before God in a time of sincere confession together using the words of the Lord's Prayer to guide us. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Forgive us, Father, for the times that we forget who you are, our loving Father, our great Redeemer, and our ever-present help in times of trouble, whose spirit is forever with us. Forgive us when we act in ways that shame your name. Help us to honor and praise your name by all we think, say, and do. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us when we selfishly focus on our own lives and churches and fail to bring your love and grace to the world around us. Forgive us for when we wish to remain safe, when we wish to remain sheltered, for when we don't have time to open our eyes to the hurting people around us, in our neighborhoods, congregations, cities, our country, and our world. Help us be bearers of your kingdom and willingly and faithfully do your work as your angels in heaven do. Amen. Friends, hear these words of assurance from Acts 13 and Ephesians 1. Through Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Amen. that in this sanctuary, there are stained glass windows with the Lord's Prayer on it? I bet you didn't know. Oh, we do? We sure do. Let me show it to you. Right here is the first window where it says, Our Father who art in heaven. So we have the second panel of the Lord's Prayer, and it says, Hallowed be thy name. Hmm, hallowed, what does that mean? Hmm, that is a hard word, isn't it? Well, I have a story for you. Let's go find out what hallowed means. In the Bible, there is a prophet named Isaiah. Well, one day, just like any other day, something amazing happened to Isaiah. <gasps> he saw God. God sat on a throne. Angels with six wings sat next to God. The angels used two wings to cover their faces, two wings to cover their feet, and two wings to fly. They sang, holy, holy, holy is God. The walls shook, and so did Isaiah's knees. Isaiah was amazed. God was more awesome than Isaiah ever knew. One angel carried a hot coal and touched it to Isaiah's mouth. Guess what? The coal didn't burn. Instead, it took away the fear inside him. Who should I send to be a prophet for me? God asked Isaiah. Now, there was something new on his lips, not a hot coal, 
but brave new words. Isaiah heard his own voice say, send me. Wow, that was so cool. Isaiah actually got to see God and God is holy. That's right. God is holy, which means God is set apart. God is like nobody else that you know. And because God calls us to be his children, we are also holy. So just like in the story, we have the angels on the stained glass pan windows, panels, and look, they're saying, holy, holy, holy. You see, when we say, send me, I want to be the one to go help my friend. Send me, I want to be the one to show love and kindness to those who need it. That's when we get to be set apart just like God. And so I hope you'll say, send me, when God says, who shall I send? to spread my love and my words of encouragement and kindness and the good news. You say, send me. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you for calling us to be your children. Thank you for calling us to go out and spread your love. Thank you for setting us apart to do your will. Help us to be your servants and spread your good news wherever we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, friends, have a great week. Bye. Bye, everyone.
This morning, our scripture reading is the Lord's Prayer that comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, which we have already said. The additional scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 to 31. Listen now for the word of the Lord. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked them, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, we come now to our prayers of the people where we have the privilege to share our joys and concerns as one community, trusting in the one who hears them, our God, our Father, our parent, who promises to provide for us, to protect, to bless, and encourages us to share what is in our hearts. And so we do so as one community, trusting in the power of prayer and remembering those we have lost. We lift up Eunice Kaufman, longtime member of the Kirk, who joined the Church Triumphant on June 13th. Information about services will be made available in a congregational email. Let us keep uh, the family and friends and our community in prayer as we remember as we celebrate and as we bear witness to the resurrection, as Eunice Kaufman has now joined the church triumphant. Let us pray in the words of Francis of Assisi, servant of God. Let us pray. Lord, make us an instrument of your peace around the world where there is war and rumors of war. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine lover of our souls, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Receive now the burdens of our hearts, the concerns we have for family and friends, for places in the world that know violence and hunger and poverty. Receive also now our hearts of gratitude for all the many ways we have been blessed by graduations in our midst, by birthdays, by milestones we have achieved, that we have made it this far by faith, by your grace. And so fill our hearts, even as we journey with both sorrow and joy, fill us with gratitude, and all these things we pray in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior and brother and friend, Jesus Christ. Amen.
This morning we continue our sermon series on the Lord's Prayer, and we've moved from Our Father. Pastor Kelsey preached a beautiful sermon about how God invites us into relationship with Him, and a relationship of intimacy. Jesus called God Our Father, Abba, which means Daddy. And last week I preached about heaven and how God resides in heaven and how heaven is both right here in our midst and also at the end of the timeline, something we can look forward to and dream about together. Today we move then to the first petition in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Shatter the silence, mighty God, with your glad and glorious greetings. Banish all our fears and give us faith in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. If there is anything said this morning that is against your will, let it come to naught and do no harm. But if there is anything said this morning that is according to your will, let it be heard as if sung by the voice of angels, that hearing we might believe and believing obey. Amen. It is wedding season. Whenever I sit with a couple a month or so before a wedding, I ask them, still getting married? And they laugh and they say, yes. I guess if they weren't, we would have scheduled a different kind of meeting. And then I ask them how the planning is going. I asked this of a bride recently and she said, what they always say, I am so stressed. And this bride put her face in her hands and she rubbed her eyes. I remember my very first wedding at my former church. I asked that question of a couple and the bride started crying and I said, I'm so sorry. You know, what is not coming together for your wedding? And she said, the bubbles. And I said, what do you mean, the bubbles? They taught us a lot about weddings in seminary, but never once anything about bubbles. And so she said, at the end of the wedding, when I come out of the sanctuary, I want everyone to blow bubbles as we walk out the doors. And I don't know if it's going to happen the way I'm hoping. And I truly didn't understand this pride. They were going to get married. The license would be signed. The music would be beautiful. The homily was going to be on point, if I do say so myself. They would make the biggest promises of their lives and exchange jewelry that they might never take off, but she was consumed with bubbles. They had become the priority. She's not the only one that is concerned with bubbles, is she? We give a lot of things primary importance that don't deserve it. Our accumulation of material things is not of primary importance. Most of our stuff is bubbly, temporary, lost in an instant, and yet our money and our purchasing can take priority, can't it, in our lives. Our status with the elites or with the power people is not of primary importance either. It is, as the Italian proverb says, once the game is over, the king and the pawn go back in the same box. And yet, our status sometimes becomes primary in its importance in our lives. The worst case scenario is not of primary importance. Whatever the worst case scenario is, your anxiety wants you to believe that the worst 
case scenario is of primary importance, but your anxiety is not your friend. Now, one day the worst case scenario will be of primary importance, but it's not every day like your nemesis, your anxiety wants you to believe. What are we making our primary importance in our lives? What really matters? What really matters is our health, our family, our friendships, our purpose, God. God really matters. Do we know what we have in him, what we have in God? God's name in this world is of, should be of primary importance for us. When Jesus told the disciples to pray in this way and offered them the Lord's Prayer, he was concerned that the people of God were not on the same page about what was important in life. In that time and place, there were many religious people who offered ostentatious prayers on street corners, almost like performances. And they looked for applause from passers-by. Now, what was most important for these street prayers was their reputations as orators. But what is most important for Jesus as he offers us the Lord's Prayer is God's reputation in the world. Now, as I said, over the course of the summer, we're taking a look at the Lord's Prayer bit by bit, a phrase at a time. But today, it's important to step back, even for just a moment, and look at the Lord's Prayer as a whole. And when you do, you can see that it has a very distinct form and structure. So first, you have the address. Our Father who are in heaven. Then you have three your petitions. Your name, your kingdom, your will. Followed by three our petitions. Our daily bread, our debts, our temptation. And then the prayer is closed with a postscript. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The prayer is brief, but it packs this huge theological punch. In response to those on the street corner who go on and on for their own sake, Jesus calls his people to petition for only a few of the most important things. And the first petition, perhaps making it the most important petition is, Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. It's as if he's saying there's too much at stake here. We must be on the same page. God's name, God's reputation is important. No, it's the most important thing. Do religious people, do we understand the importance of the hallowedness of his name? Is it our first petition do we understand the importance of God's reputation? Do we know what we have in Him? There's a story about an antiques expert that stopped by an antique store filled mostly with junk, and he noticed on the floor a cat drinking milk out of a saucer. Recognizing that the saucer was actually a vase from China's Ming Dynasty, worth a fortune, he thought, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. The owner obviously doesn't realize what an important piece he's got here. I'll pull one over on him. And he went to the owner and he said, that is quite a remarkable cat you have. I'll give you $100 for it. And the owner said, well, the cat isn't really worth anything, and we're kind of attached to it. But the antiques expert persisted. And at last, the owner said, 
all right. And the man handed over a crisp $100 bill and picked up the cat. And then, trying to make it sound like a casual afterthought, he said, I'll need a bowl or something to feed my new cat. I'll give you another 10 bucks for that old saucer. Oh, I could never do that, the owner replied. That's actually a piece from the Ming Dynasty in China and it's worth a fortune. But it's the strangest thing. Ever since I started putting milk in it, I've sold 17 cats. The owner knew what he had in the saucer. He knew the importance of the saucer. He knew what he had and that made all the difference. It made all the difference in how he prioritized things. Do we know what we have? Do we understand the value of God's name and how we should take care of it? Hallowed be thy name. The religious people in first century Palestine were in large part dismissive of God's reputation. They cast it aside if it interfered with their goals and aspirations. Do today's religious people, do we understand the importance of God's reputation? Hallowed be thy name. Can you imagine a world where, where religious folks, which on most days includes us, understood the value, the importance of of God's name, God's reputation, really meant it when they prayed, hallowed be thy name. Can you imagine a world where religious folks cease to see themselves as what is most important, where they cease to be concerned with, you know, drawing attention to themselves? Hallowed be thy name. Can you imagine a world where religious folks ceased from shouting slurs from street corners in the name of God and started giving honor and glory to God's name through selfless acts of compassion and relentless pursuits of hope. Hallowed be thy name. Can you imagine if this commitment to God's reputation started with us? If we prioritize things the way that Jesus did in the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be God's name. What would change? How would our daily schedule change? How would our list of things to do change? Perhaps nothing would change. But perhaps the whole world would. Because God's reputation is on the decline Sociologist Robert Wuthnow's research shows that most people believe in God, but they believe he's taken his ball and gone home and that he's no longer interested in us. There are too many people being booted from their homes and looted of their dignity and muted by their poverty for people to believe anything else about God. Research done by the Barna Group says that when 16 to 29-year-olds were asked, what do you think when you hear the word Christian? 87% responded, judgmental. 85% said, hypocritical. 72% reported that Christians were out of touch with reality and 68% pegged Christians as boring. And they aren't sticking around for it. Nearly two-thirds of U.S. 18 to 29-year-olds who grew up in the church tell Barna that they have withdrawn from church involvement as an adult after having been active as a child or teen. And Barna researcher and author David Kinneman reports that one of the biggest surprises for researchers was the extent to which respondents said that modern-day Christianity was no longer like Jesus. What is happening to God's reputation and what part do we have in it? Can you imagine if this com commitment 
to God's reputation started with us. Hallowed be thy name. What would change? Perhaps nothing. And perhaps the whole world. Because when we get the priorities right in our lives, in our churches, everything is more beautiful. When you get the priority right, the priorities right in your life, everything will be more beautiful. In my very first wedding at my first church, there were bubbles. But the poor bride let those bubbles determine her happiness that day. And I worry that in the same way, our preoccupation with bubbles, the things that aren't really important, it's going to determine the happiness of our whole lives. For my very last wedding at my first church, there were bubbles too. That wedding was on the beach and those bubbles came with the ocean water. If you've ever been to a wedding on the beach, you know that there's a lot less than get, that can be controlled there. You can't control the rain or the wind. You can't control the noise from other beachgoers. And you certainly can't control how those other beachgoers will be watching or what they will be wearing as they do. And on that particular day in June, I can recall sand blowing. I can recall oppressive heat and copious sweat. And yes, I can recall beachgoers and all manner of swim work creeping in to look on. But I can also recall it being one of the most beautiful and sincere weddings I've ever been a part of. At this wedding, like so many beach weddings, all of the things that too often take priority in so many weddings had to be released, let go of, which made the priorities a bit easier to get in order. God, love, promises, family, and somewhere way down the line, bubbles washing up on shore, brought by God like the most perfect and unexpected wedding gift. If we put Him first, if the hallowedness of His name is our first petition, it's of primary importance, God will bring the bubbles and all kinds of other beautiful things. At least that's what I've found. When Jesus makes the hallowedness of God's name the first petition of the Lord's Prayer, He is inviting us to reconsider everything else that we are making first. The things that we are overvaluing and overfocusing on in our lives. And trust that as we make his name first, as we put proper value on that, God will make our church more beautiful, our lives more beautiful, our journey together from our banner days like wedding days to our most ordinary days more beautiful too. And like with that beach wedding, all the onlookers, many of whom have given up on the church, on life, on the journey, they won't be able to resist watching and noticing that God just might not be as missing as they once thought. Amen.
So what are you making most important in your life? Are things in the right order? Today, I want to invite you to make important what Jesus invites us to make most important in the first petition, the very first petition of the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be thy name. Let's be part of the project of increasing God's reputation in the world by living and loving more and more like Jesus every day. And as we do, may we love God so much that we love nothing too much. And may we fear God enough that we fear nothing at all. And all God's children said, Amen.